Hello, hello. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the Kabuki Strength Chat. Strength Chat. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. <laughs> Today, it is just myself, the mad scientist of strength. That's right, Chris Duffin. Very far down on my left, the wizard of training, Mr. Brandon Sen. Brilliant shirt, by the way, today, Chicago Cubs, you know. You know, they happen to have a gym full of, what shall we say, Kabuki Strength oh, products. That's, why I, that's why I know, I love I it. I knew they'd be watching. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you'll notice our, our partner in crime, Dr. Rudolph, is missing today. That's right. He is out celebrating his, I believe, his 72nd anniversary with his wife. Wow. I might be exaggerating a little bit on yeah. the date there, but I, 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 I like to. So. They must have gotten together that were 10 years old. <laughs> it's like 100 years old. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's really worth celebrating. It, yeah, it's worth celebrating. It's really, really worth it's celebrating. It's as old as a turtle. One of those giant pieces <laughs> in the zoo. And uh, today, we've got uh, Tony, Tony Sentiment, a.k.a. Real World Tactical with us today. So... Um, and Pleasure actually, to be here, guys. Yeah, we've uh, it's an honor. we did a little bit more than just uh, the podcast that we're gonna do. We did a actually Tony took us out and did a, uh, a little training with us yesterday and uh, taught me how to shoot. So um, I don't think I've handled a gun since I was a teenager. You know, shooting uh, shooting rabbits so I could you know have a meal type stuff. But uh, <laughs> that was uh, that was uh, really the last time. Uh, I had really spent much time with a gun. How'd that go, Tony? Was he any good? Um, yeah, he was really good. Be honest man. with our for, Yeah, no, no. He, uh, for the first time shooting, uh, and I think it was your first time shooting a handgun, wasn't it? Not? His first time shooting a handgun, yes. Uh, he did very well. Uh, he was shooting at 10 yards, 8 inch still plate, you know what I mean? So, and, and we did some stress shooting, you know, he got the, their heart rate pumping, and he did a good job. I mean, his attire was not the greatest attire for like Sandals. the type of training so, that we were doing. So, so, but. so we, we, did, we did kind of, we were both underprepared and overprepared at the same time. Yes, so, you know, yes, yes. Uh, yes, I had flip-flops and had to be corrected there. Um, <laughs> shorts with no belt. Sh shorts with no belt, yes. Uh, he we, shoots his pants. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, who's supposed to have been planning for this for like the last several weeks, will... Uh, Did a will, horrible job. Jesse, you're fired. Je Je Jesse, <laughs> you're fired, Jesse. It's Jesse kind of... <laughs> he, he forgot to bring... The steel targets. targets. <laughs> and Tony said before we left, Make sure to get some steel targets. Just I got them. We're gonna get in, and, and we got up there, and there was no no targets to shoot. No targets. So yeah. we had to send Jesse back to town. But on the overprepared side, we show up to the the you know the gravel pits where we're gonna do the shooting. Yes. And it's locked down. Of course, you know Jesse's like because Jesse this he planned this is where we're gonna be. We show up. It's locked. He's really messing up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And Jesse uh, was all over the place. But you know what? He had a great time. He though. did. He did. he he was on cloud nine. Yeah. Like, <laughs> he had a good time. I turned to him yesterday and I said. Hey, you know, we're sitting there under the, the canopy, and I slap his leg, and I'm like, "Hey, Jesse." He's like, "What?" I'm like, "This is your job." He's like, "You know, you're never gonna get rid of me." <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have Tony but, that come down at least once every other month. Now <laughs> we get to do so, this. So, uh, but uh, we, we show and and. They're, so I'm like, oh, no, no problem. We'll throw all the gear in the back of my truck. I'll just drive around this barrier. And everybody there doubted me. <laughs> They're all like, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, everybody was like, mm, I don't know. It's kind of steep. How are we going to get back? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, no, no, no. But it was kind of... Uh, it went pretty uh, quick. It, it, well, it, I, I drove over it. It was so easy. Yeah. It was like kind of like, oh, well, that was like... I, I wish it was actually harder because, like, it was just like kind of just like I don't know. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was too easy. Too easy. You to drive yeah, we got it on but, video too, so we'll be able to see yeah. it on YouTube. I'm sure they'll put it up. Yeah, but, going over there. but at the same time, we, 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 uh, we connected to have discussions about when shit really goes down and this world falls apart. Like, that is I, a drug to have. I, I got the war rate. Up, up, uh, <laughs> pop, what is that? Apocalypse? <laughs> yes. Apocalypse. The apocalypse. Because <laughs> that drug, you can put it anywhere and it goes over anything. Yeah. So you know? Tony's got all the the protection. I I'll, I'll bring I'll bring the uh, the, the, the wheels. The wheels. The wheels. I think once we get the the skeleton, the exoskeleton on that Dodge Durango, we'll be good with the fifty cal on top of that. Fifty cal on top. You are coming up, right? Yeah. Oh I'll yes, we're here. gonna go to I'll the desert. Here. Put a fifty cal on that bitch. Yeah. Hell yeah. See, and then when stuff goes down, that exo cage it was easy, really easy to bolt all the uh, armor. On top yes, of it, it'll all be better. there. You just armor it up, and you're. Sounds like yeah. you're gonna make a tank. Uh, well, yeah, kind of. I mean, it does have run flats and central tire inflation. <laughs> and, you know, like it, it's got everything. It's, you it's need. pretty much set up for yeah. for exactly what we're talking about. So, 
Well, I guess we should do uh, do a little bit of introductions here. Some some of our audience. Um, Tony is a little bit outside of the spectrum of some of the people that we normally talk to, but falls exactly in the world that we want to want to play in as well. It's application of strength and conditioning uh, in different environments. So. Uh, Tony owns Real World Tactical, and it's uh, focused on basically urban, urban and tactical shooting environments. Uh, hybrid, he's got his hybrid training. Uh, Tony is also involved on the uh, product in uh, uh, bringing new products out. Uh, right now, he's got uh, uh, actually he's got one coming uh, underway. Weighted here. vest. Uh, I got a couple different things. Some resistance band training kit, weighted vest coming out, uh, um, hammer coming out that I designed, all that good stuff. So yeah, a couple products here and there. Yeah. So, you know, let's, well actually, let's, uh, you know, I know your, your experience, you know, uh, ex-SWAT, uh, ex you've just retired and kind of doing, uh, doing your own thing now this last uh, uh, year or two, but uh, run, us, run our audience through My background. Uh, your background. Yeah. So, uh, I started off in the Marine Corps, 18 years old, went into the Marine Corps, did four years Marine Corps. By the time that I got out of there, I was a firearms instructor and a close combat instructor of the Marine Corps, what we call it PMI, um, and then went into law enforcement straight after. Did 15 years law enforcement. Most of my career was in SWAT operations, um, and I retired last year to do the company full time. I ran the company part time, two years um, teaching, and before I actually like decided to say, hey, you know what, I want to do this full time. I think I started in 2014. I want to say, and then we are here today. Um, the company is firearms training, so I teach uh, tactical firearms training to law enforcement, uh, to regular civilians as well as uh, military, and. It also has my functional strength program, my high intensity combat athlete training program. That I do online training, and then I obviously I'm a sponsored athlete for different companies, and then you know that's yeah. pretty much all. So you know one of the reasons that uh, prime reason uh, that uh, we want to have you here, besides you know me getting some personal firearms instructions, which I did, <laughs> <laughs> was uh, uh, you know you're doing what a lot of people say that can't be done, like the mixture of. MMA, conditioning, speed, agility, and like strength uh, training as well, and like being strong. Like we're not talking. I mean, I you know you've got a recent Instagram video up of doing uh, uh, 675 for for a dead stop triple on deadlifts. You know that's that's respectable numbers. And uh, but at the same time, like that's not your focus. Your focus is having a balance, correct, of that with those other things. So. Um, how do you like? Let's let's talk a little bit about this hybrid uh, hybrid training program. What's involved there? Um, well, the program was originally designed for law enforcement, military personnel, and uh, probably you know MMA guys. Uh, it was more designed a system where it's a functional strength system with intensity, high intensity, explosive work. But at the same time, uh, your goal is to be twenty pounds stronger. Uh, the guy's twenty pounds heavier than you are, stronger than him and uh, faster than a guy who's 20 pounds lighter than you are. So you're, you, you find that balance. You know, an elite guy would say, as long as you're squatting double your weight, then lifting double your weight, and then benching 1.5, one and a half of your weight, then you're, you're good. You're good there in the strength department. Now it's pretty much adding the endurance, the agility, the explosive work, and obviously having a good solid core, because you're all the unorthodox lifting that you would be doing as law enforcement, military. You know, um, having to pick someone up off the ground, uh, these different things that you would have to do. You know, just, and the thing is that it calls for anything. You're coming up off your knee. It's not just like compound movements where it's one, two. You know, it's get off your knee, grab the guy, put him on your shoulder, get off the other knee. And then, you know, have to brace yourself and pick up. And then, obviously, you don't want to tear something in the process of that. So you want to build that body, resi the resistance, you know, to adapt the body to that type of lifting. Yeah, really building resilience to be able to handle loads in a lot of different arenas from the strength right. standpoint, right? right? And then still be able to run, chase after a guy, fight with a guy, and so on and so forth. Having the endurance to do those things, the stamina to do them. No. You know? That's something, you know, I claim to have had some point in my life, but you know, I kind of uh, godly, I did. When you, when, you, when you start, you know, when you start I, deadlifting I, I, and squatting I, almost a thousand pounds, that's, that's you know, that kind of goes out that, the window. That, that's, what said, claim, that's what I said, claim to have had, claim to have had. This guy will take naps as rest periods on the couch out there between deadlift sets. Between deadlift sets. Uh, He's like, okay, let me take a five minute rest and I'll go deadlift 900 pounds again. Five minutes, yeah, right. Try, try 20 minutes. <laughs> 
That's not an exaggeration. Uh, uh, I, d- d- this is this is accurate. This is accurate. <laughs> but there was a time. There was a time I did have I did have endurance. So I, I do know what's involved. I, just, I choose that. I choose, I choose not, not to express it anymore. So, but you know, so it's funny. Like, you know, you, bring something up, Christian. You know, it's funny how people say um, I'm a hybrid athlete, or they claim this hybrid, you know, hybrid stuff. But then they're doing, you know, then you're saying you're you're a hybrid athlete, but you're a power bodybuilder. How is that a hybrid athlete? Like you're doing two of the, all you're doing is isolation work and strength work. To me, a hybrid athlete, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you, you've been in the industry long I have, would be a, someone who does the two total opposites. So to, for you to be a hybrid athlete, you have to be a strong guy or whatever, bodybuilder, power builder, and then a guy who has some form of endurance, mm-hmm. stamina. That would be combined into two separate, I mean. Yeah, I, I consider it exactly one of my personal philosophies is like a balance of extremes, right? You correct, know, yeah. Which is exactly what you're you're talking that's about. That's what I try to do, correct, yeah. That's, that's you know, trying to balance the two. Yeah. So where do you where do you start with with like you got a new client um, with knowing what's what's the focus or priorities are you building all at once are you focusing on specific areas uh, how, what does that look like uh, you, well you first have to evaluate the client just like everything else in the world you have to evaluate where they're at at their in their fitness levels and then you have to break it down on what their job function is so whether they're law enforcement, whether they're military, whether they're a fighter, whatever it is that it is, then you have to pretty much, it would be literally like what you would call sports specific evaluation. So I want to get this guy, and then you have to work his deficiencies. I want to get this guy to become this way, and then I'm gonna work on his deficiencies on what he lacks in. So my evaluation that day for my program will say, okay, this is what he lacks in, all right, so we're gonna build that program for the next 12 weeks, this is what we're gonna work on to make you either faster, either stronger, either have endurance, because you could be a guy that's really strong, a lot of cops are very strong, but they, they can't run from here to the freaking corner. Same concept, you know, and then they can't run from here to the corner without anything on them. So now you gotta put on a plate carrier, or you gotta put on a vest on, and still do it, and right. try to get them to a point where it's, they're proficient at it. They don't have to be the fastest, but if they weigh 220 pounds or 200 pounds, you wanna get them respectable numbers. You know what I'm saying? At the same time, not lose his strength. Right. Because what will happen is you concentrate too much on that running, too much on that endurance, you don't work on any strength, and now you lose all the strength that he had. So you have to maintain that strength. And that's probably one of the hardest parts, because you want to focus 100% on one type, of, one type of sport or one type of exercise or one type of function element, and then you forget totally about the other one. Yeah. You can't do that. It's literally remaining on that one, keeping what he has, and then just building on it. Right, so let's say you get somebody to that double body weight squat, double body weight deadlift, one and a half bench. You're not gonna really work on building that, you're just gonna work on maintaining that now while you build those other Correct. Those other aspects. But usually, believe it or not, usually when you build on the other aspects and you build that work capacity up, most of the time, they're those the bench, the squat, usually go up. Bench, squat, and, and deadlift usually go up. Not crazy numbers. But they, they're, and what they could do it for, let's say they did it for three or four reps, they usually could end up doing it five, six, seven reps. Why? Because the endurance is there, the stamina is there, you built on that. So, and that strength, as long as you're building that core, you know, as long as you build that core, you only get better. You know what I'm saying? What, what's, the, what's the most challenging aspect of, of training in that fashion? The recovery. The recovery is probably the hardest thing, I want to say, and it depends on the person's age. Obviously, someone who's younger is going to re- recover faster. Because now you're 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 working on if you're doing strength conditioning one day, then you're working on strength another day, then you're working on endurance another day, and MMA another day, or fighting another day. Each one of those different elements of the system or the program uh, is going to have a different recovery factor. So you're gonna today your back might be messed up, tomorrow your legs might be messed up, the next day your arms might be messed up. So you're always constantly recovering. So some some people you have to give them hey, you gotta like just do isolation work for a day or two. So your body recovers, you know, because you don't want anybody to get to hurt, you know. And obviously, a lot of these people, they work and it's their lives on the line. Yeah, so, and I say that's like one of the worst things. Like you definitely probably have to manage on the train because that's they have to do their jobs, right? So you correct. gotta it, at some point you gotta you can't be pushing the full limits while you're developing this stuff. Yeah, because exactly. You don't want a guy to go to work and he's so sore that he can't even walk, or he's so sore that he can't get out of his car. Because what happens if he has to fight somebody? What happens if he gets into a foot chase? You know, then he can't. He's gonna be at thirty or forty percent when he needs to be at least at eighty, ninety percent. You know, right. it defeats the whole purpose of yeah. what you're trying to do. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So you have to find that balance. You know, um, it all depends too on the shifts because a lot of these guys work. Some guys work twelve-hour shifts. Some do ten-hour shifts. Some do eight. You know, the twelve-hour shifters they have a lot of days off, mm-hmm. so they're able to you know recover easily. Or the ten-hour guys too because they have t- three days off. 
So on their days off, you know, you hit them hard on the first day, second and third day they're recovering from whatever it is you're doing and you work, you know, like that. If they're working those long shifts, uh, do you have them training on those shift days or just uh, taking? Hey, usually, yeah, yeah, okay. I usually, just it's not the two hour, hour and a half, two hour crazy session, you know what I'm saying? I would have it doing like that. Okay. Where it would be more like isolation work or we're breaking down circuits and you're making them work certain circuits for that day. It's, uh, uh, let's say a hit day, but it's only a 15, 20 minute hit day. So instead of doing like a, a full fledged out 30 or 45 minute high intensity day where you'd run how we did it, pretty much how we did it yesterday, mm -hmm. where you start one exercise, second exercise, third exercise, and then putting it all together, you would just pretty much work on whatever specific thing we're working for that day. Let's say it would be the agility work, whether it would be explosive work, whether it was speed, speed work, or even just maybe just running a mile and a half for time, whatever it is, you know, whatever the program is for the design for that particular person. Right. And whatever deficiencies he has, you know, because a lot of people don't realize Cops in general, even military, wearing their plate carries and all those different type of things, they're always, the, 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 what they're lifting is always messed up. It's not even, it's not stable, it's not balanced. Uh, magazines are set on one side, it weighs more on your left side than your right side, so you're always constantly trying to recorrect it with your posture. Uh, same thing when you're wearing drop rigs or a holster on your, on your right side, it's always gonna take more of a toll on your hip flexor than your than your left leg. So your hip flexor is gonna have an imbalance, your right leg is gonna be stronger than your left leg because of that constant having to walk every day, pulling that, you know, the, the weight or whatever it is. Right. So you gotta fix that in a lot of a lot of the guys as well. Yeah, we, I've definitely seen that with, uh, you know, our pe people in uh, police and fire that had come into our, our facility here and trained as some of those ingrained imbalances just from, you know, the things that they have to deal with every day. You know? I'll tell you one thing uh, that I, and I was notorious for this was, uh, a wallet. I would always carry a wallet in my right, on the right side of my, oh, your head yeah, head. and it always, you're sitting in a car sometimes yeah. for eight, ten hours, you know, driving around or looking, you know, and you're you're like this the whole entire time, yeah. you know, and that's like the worst thing, you you get up and your lower back, the right side of your lower back's hurting, you know, and yeah. the guys have thick wallets, yeah. Why? a lot of cops, because they have their badge, their ID and everything yeah. on there, so it's a thick wallet, you know. That's, a, that's an interesting uh, point for, I think, everyone, realizing that there are imbalances in life in general. Like I quit wearing a wallet in my back pocket like yeah. a decade ago, for same reason. But like your car, the car, the same thing. You've got this, one leg's a little more open sitting there running the gas pedal and the other, you know, it's like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see, you know, some the issues related to that. And that's, yeah. just, that's just the way it is. <laughs> you gotta deal with it, you know what I'm saying? And try to adjust as best as you can. Yeah. You know. mentioned recovery being like the biggest factor in maybe determining success of these programs. Mm -hmm. Take uh, people through like what a week of your training is like to give them an idea of the actual recovery demands. Uh, it all depends on the person because obviously some people eat right, some people take supplements, you know, uh, and then the age factor is huge. Um, you get an older individual or whatever, he's obviously not going to recover the same as someone who's 20, 25 years old, you know. So uh, depending on what you're doing, and it also depends on their weight. Because you can have a guy that's, uh, let's say, 175 pounds, 180 pounds, and he can get through an agility day easy. You know, an explosive day, he can do box jumps, he can do all this, and he'll be fine the next day. You get the same guy, and you put him, let's say he's 220 pounds, put him through that same routine, and he'll be destroyed the next day. Just because his knees, his lower back, and all that's not used to it, because he's a heavier guy. Especially if he's under six feet tall. You figure a guy who's 220, 230, under six feet tall, he's got some weight on him. Not if he's 6'3", 6'4". A guy who's 232, you know, 230, 240, and he's 6364, he's average, because he's so tall. So he'll be different than a guy who's under six feet, you know? Um, for the heavier guys, strength conditioning always kills them more. You know, for the for the, um, the lighter guys, the powerlifting, that hardcore heavy trauma to like the core and to their back usually affects them longer. And they have, especially the legs, the legs department, they have to take maybe a day or two off, you know? Usually on the day or two off, you're talking about, uh, let's say I do strength conditioning on Monday, do isolation work on Tuesday, then do powerlifting or some form of strength work on Wednesday. Depending on you are, how you are coming off those three days will be depending on what you're gonna do Thursday and Friday. You may take a day off Thursday. If you're really, really bad, you'll take off that Thursday, give it just straight rest day, and then jump back into it again on, on Friday. You know what I'm saying? Uh, depending on what it is. If you have MMA, if you're the type of guy that likes to do MMA stuff, um, then I usually, I would say, okay, if you're doing those three days and on that Thursday, you do, okay, we're gonna do some pad work, we're gonna do some striking, which affects your shoulders, it's not really hurting your lower back, and you can take it easy and you can still do, I don't know, 10 rounds, 11 rounds on the bag, you know, on the pads, and so on and so forth.
know, which is still cardio, which is oh, yeah. probably one of the worst cardio there. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, being a wrestler in my background, I realized how much those, you know, <laughs> MMA, jiu-jitsu, any of those type of activities are just, it's some of the hardest work you can do. Oh, yeah. 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 Cardio-wise, you know, it's, it's just like running is a certain type of cardio. You know, running is cardio, uh, let's say work capacity, powerlifting is cardio, where you're doing, let's say, 10, 15, 20 reps of squats, whatever, for like a, what, a 60%, uh, uh, I don't know, you guys do velocity here, so <laughs> like a 60%, uh, you know, um, yeah. weight for you, um, that's cardio, you know, sprinting is cardio, and then fighting is cardio, striking is a type of cardio, and then jujitsu is a type of cardio, and it all works the body a different way. Just because probably your body posture, I'm assuming, you're on the floor, you're pulling, you're fighting, compared to where you're just doing a compound movement for a lot of times. At the end of the day, uh, for me, I like to have at least some form of, expose my body to some form of cardio in all the aspects. So when it does come, or when it did come, I wasn't, it wasn't like something brand new to me. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it is, what I had to do, you know? Uh, if you get a guy that has never done Jiu Jitsu in his whole entire life, the first time you put him on the floor and you spar with him, he's gonna be gassed yeah, within a minute. Yeah. Same thing yeah. as a, a guy who puts on gloves and you wanna do pad work with the guy. And I don't mean like hitting the bag because anybody can just hit a bag for three or four rounds and you know, relax. I mean, you have an actual trainer that's in front of you going, one, two, three, four, one, three, four, and you're doing two minutes, you just wanna fucking die at the end of that. You know, you're like, fuck, this has killed me. Especially somebody, and then not only that, but if you're a bigger guy, your shoulders. Oh, Especially yeah. the bodybuilder guys or the bigger type dudes with the big shoulders. They can't even keep their hands up in two rounds. You know, their their hands are down here the whole entire time. You know, so it, it shows that every everything works the body a different way. Every different you know exercise. Oh yeah, especially if their posture is already not great, maybe from sitting in a patrol car oh. all day or another thing too. You go from zero to a hundred miles an hour in seconds. People don't realize that. It doesn't matter how old you are. I don't care if you're thirty or forty. It, that's probably one of the hardest things to do. So if you're not used to sprinting or you're not used to doing this stuff, the minute you jump out of that car and your adrenaline is pumping and your heart rate's at a buck 75 and you're chasing after whatever subject you're going after, there was no chance to like, okay, hold on one second, let me stretch out. <laughs> yeah, let let me warm up. <laughs> you know, and, uh, no, no, and, then, and, then, and on top of that, now you weigh probably an extra 20, 25 pounds heavier because you got a plate carrier on or you got a vest on with your gun and all that yeah. stuff. So, and a lot of people do end up getting hurt. They end up pulling a hammy, take, breaking something, jumping a fence. Uh, I, I, in my one guy, got caught on a fence one time years ago and destroyed his elbow, completely destroyed his elbow, his whole arm. Another guy landed, landed wrong, broke his knee. You know what I'm saying? In a fight, a kid didn't know how to throw a punch and he got the boxer's fracture. It happens. It's gonna happen. No, it's, a, it's an interesting point. In real world, you don't get a chance to warm up like when something no. happens. And that falls back to something you may not be familiar with. We preach all the time, like, we wanna move well and move cleanly. We, We've got a subscription-based website on movement preparation. We try to get all this stuff done. But at the end of the day, we try to teach, like, you're working towards not doing any of that. You want to work to where you can just get in and move. And if you have to do it, like, we prescribe, like, it needs to be done in nine minutes or less. Like, you're all your warm, like, you're not your warm-up for the, the exercise, but, like, and then your movement preparation. Yeah, yeah, movement preparation. doing stretching, yeah. whatever it is. Mobility, like, you whatever be, work you're doing. If, yeah. if you've got to if you got to do 45 minutes worth of work before you can train, yeah, that's a problem. You need to really reevaluate things. And that becomes <laughs> that was me in the mornings. That's me in the mornings. Like, oh my god, what like, pains I got. I'm like, but I'm, I'm not doing like yeah, this yeah, you know, you're you're at a, you know, uh, you know, in fire, like you know, and you know, house is burning. You know, you're in the truck, you're off. You don't get to go. Well, hey, 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 hey hold, hold. Let me do some okay, mobility work. About 45 minutes. We got to get our mobility work in. Then we're gonna jump in the wagon, and then we're gonna go yeah. over there and try to save your house. Hey, listen, like, I have that, that doesn't happen. For those guys, for the firefighters, <laughs> to tell you. That. I mean, they got to put that bunker gear on. They got to put the SCBA yeah. on. They got to put all that stuff on and go into that house. And that's not an environment you can control. Uh, you go into a burning house or a burning building, and I tell people, you, I don't care how good of a firefighter you are. It's not up to you. It's up to that house on whether it's going to stand up and then you're going to be able to get to that fucking burning house, you know, and save whatever life you got to save. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I have much respect for those guys when they work. Because ninety percent of the time they don't do damn thing, <laughs> but when they do work, you gotta have a lot of respect for them, you know. Because uh, it, it's not like being a cop to a certain extent. Uh, being a police officer, you can control the environment that you get yourself into. Um, whether you want to be a proactive police officer or you want to just be like a defensive police, you know, where right. you don't really do much. And at the same time, depending on your skill level, will depend or on your training as well. Will depend on whether you live or die in other situations that you get yourself into. You know, a uh, firefighter, you can be the best firefighter in the world and that freaking roof collapses on you, then there you go. 
you know, there's no, there's no controlling that. You yeah, control your very, very true. You know? What do you think about some of the fitness standards for tactical populations, police, fire? Um, you know, because it sounds like what what you're getting at with the people you work with is above whatever the uh, standard is. baseline is. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so what do you think about it's that? It's really hard. Opinion? I mean, you know, honestly, um, I went through my ups and downs as a as a law, you know, law enforcement officer, and it just depends on the person. I've always tried to maintain some form of physical standard. I was in SWAT. You have to. Um, I got really big to a point where I was two fifty five to sixty in, in the in the mid two thousands. Realized that that wasn't very good after an incident that I had. Um, uh, had to run after a guy for two and a half blocks, you know, and then have to fight the guy after you know, it was an armed robbery subject. Uh, I realized, wow, maybe 255 is not that good. But right. being 255, also at the same time, I was cock yeah, diesel. You, you catch it. And, yeah, <laughs> you know what? Well, it was not even that because I didn't have the cardio. Yeah. My cardio was gone. I was strong, but my cardio was out the door. I mean, but I would get out of my car on scenes, and because I had that big look, people would mess with me. So I avoided a lot of issues. Right, a lot of paperwork. Yeah. You know what I mean. So at the same time, it's like a double-edged sword. When the day you really gotta use it, yeah, you're gonna be hurting. But most of the time, it's gonna come few, far, and in between compared to when you're just like a regular Joe Schmo. When some guy looks at you, he's like, I can take this guy. You know, yeah. um, it's really hard for 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 cops just because of the simple fact that a lot of those guys work midnights. A lot of those guys have families. Um, they're working overtime all the time to support their family. So it's it, it's tough. You know what I mean? And 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 I try not to judge anybody, obviously. Now, I don't care what you tell me. If you're super overweight or super obese or whatever it may be, then you gotta do something. There's no reason for that, you know what I mean? I don't care if it's dieting, then diet, whatever. But if I get into a fight and you're so bad, out of shape, that you can't even get out of your car fast enough to help me fight this guy, an armed robber or whatever, that's a fucking problem. That's a problem. Because now you're risking your life and your partner's life. So you have to have some form of standard. You gotta do. I don't care it's if it's a it's a liability. I don't care if it is even going to the treadmill three times a week for twenty or thirty minutes and you're running. I don't care fifteen minutes, twenty minutes of your life. That's fine. I'll take that. That's better than nothing. You know what I mean? There's no excuse to yeah. be a cop for 10, 12 years and never never see the inside of a gym. Right. There's no excuse for yeah. that. You know what I mean? Because almost every department in the country has a gym at the at the station. So a lot of my buddies, you know, SWAT guys or whatever that used to work bin nights or whatever. They would go and are after their midnight shift and go work out and then go home. It's there. Yeah, you get, that's convenient. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. there. It's tough because you just got off yeah. midnight shift, so yeah, a lot of them have to drink, you know, like whatever pre workout or, or some kind of stimulant, you know, to uh, get them going. But once they get going, you're good. You get adjust your body adjusts. You know what I'm saying? Um, I could never do midnights. I always I was always either afternoon shift or, or day shift, just because I'm I'm like a very comfortable driver. So uh, whenever I would work midnights on the way home, I almost killed myself like two or three times, would fall asleep on the wheel. So I realized that real quick that like, I couldn't, I had to be like, a sh even an afternoon shift, you're working twice as hard because it's just call after call after call after call, right. delay after delay, you know, but I rather that than freaking kill myself, you know. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, not, uh, you know, I, I would agree, and I had, would agree and with your decision making process. There so. was times where I, they'd force you over and yep. a regular job, sometimes they force you over, there's not enough yep. people to work. I got forced over one year and um, one time, and uh, I was working minutes. Got forced over a day shift. Went to McDonald's, had some food or whatever. Got you know how when you get food and yep. different circulation. Got behind the wheel, made a right turn on the street, passed out on the wheel, and freaking ended up crashing into some poor old man. He was there to make a left turn and hit him in the back. You know, what are you gonna do? You know what I'm saying? You're tired. You've been working for you know 15, 20 hours. You know it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it happens. You know, and it's an accident. It's exactly what it is. Nothing you can do about it. I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about uh, uh, my learning experiences from from yesterday okay. because there was some there were some interesting things and we've talked a few times uh, about this already. Um, you know, we do a lot here with you know breathing, bracing. You call it breath control. What you were as yeah. you referenced yesterday when we were shooting, and uh, there just seems so much corollary over to like what we're doing that helps from a performance aspect in the you know the physical training world that also seems to really relate well to that control stabilization yeah. that needs to happen during during the shooting. shooting. Yeah, correct. And uh, I think that might be one of the reasons that I did fairly decent for for you know lack of experience yeah. um, is the the practice and control there but I um, you know that's it, it seems like some really critical stuff as far as the bracing, the posture, being loose and tight in the right areas and being able to control some of that stuff yeah well, you're definitely yeah you're definitely gonna have an up you know on a lot of just because of your background you know uh, um, 
when you're, it, it's a little different than when you're just shooting just normal, like when you go to a range, and then when you're shooting on the, under the conditions that you were shooting. Yeah, as I say, I think that was actually a, a, probably a challenging way for, for someone to learn, right? Like <laughs> throwing sandbags over your shoulders yeah. and doing squats and farmer's carries. So, and, the, and, then, mean, and then my first experience handgun <laughs> shooting, being doing that. So. Yeah. Which you did very <laughs> well. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so you guys understand, we, I, I put him, I, I yesterday, you'll see this on the YouTube video, I put Chris through just, uh, we, we taught him the fundamentals in the beginning, and then we I put him through one of my um, stations or one of my workouts, uh, which, you know, the combat conditioning, where he has to shoot with an elevated heart rate. Um, and there's a lot of aspects and elements that go into that. Uh, I normally wouldn't do that right off the back like I would with a regular student, but since Chris had to pretty much get the crash course quickly and efficiently, <laughs> you know, he got the whole full force, you know, in, in three or four hours, so. And he did very good. He was shooting, I got Chris shooting out to about 10 yards on an eight inch steel plate um, under high stress. So I would say maybe his heart was, uh, you're probably about a buck 60. You know what I mean? Maybe. Who knows, for me it might have been through the roof. Yeah, it might have been, yeah. Might have been <laughs> closer to like the 180 department, you know? So, and he did good. And it's just, uh, breathing has a lot of aspect, controlling your breathing, understanding to apply the fundamentals, why your heart rate. And, and something that I preach a lot is, you know, you, when your heart is pumping and it's coming out of your throat and your lungs are like gasping for air, that has nothing to do with your trigger finger. And I preach that all the time. And it, it's kind of like when you tap your head and uh, make circles in your stomach. Same concept, you know, two different things, two, two different things that you're doing, but your body can do it. Uh, it's multitasking. Once you get it, since Chris has been, let's say in a squat, he has to do, he has to do so many elements to provide that perfect squat for that perfect one rep max, you know, um, he's already been adjusted to that over the years. So for him, multitasking isn't hard. It was just getting him used to that muscle memory of, okay, I have to do, getting him to remember it. The fundamentals is the hardest part. You know, okay, for, uh, you know, front side pulse, okay, side alignment, side picture, trigger squeeze, breathe, natural respiratory pause, and all these different fundamentals you gotta do when you shoot. So, but once towards the end, you were doing good. You did really good. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, I can tell you that it was definitely, definitely a lot of fun, and I uh, look forward to uh, learning and practicing a little bit more as I go forward. So yeah, you take that up instead of speed axing. No, no. What's, that, what's Temper, the sport called? I, Timber sports. No, yes. listen. Give me a give me, give, give, give me a fist bump, Tony. I'm Timber gonna sports. be here yes, yes. for that speed axing. When he gets into that, he's gonna bring me over. We already talked about that because I'm all about it. <laughs> That's a mad skill, man. Yeah. I've seen those tournaments, bro. They're crazy. Those guys. You're gonna see me and Tony uh, uh, yeah, going doing, at doing the big saw together. Yeah. Oh, oh, saw. Sh oh yeah. <laughs> bro, my arms are gonna be like 20 <laughs> inches, bro. Like that big, bro. Like, I get I all think, into that. I think if the two of us showed up at one of those competitions, <laughs> we, it, it, everybody would just quit. We quit. We quit. We quit. <laughs> just the saw part. Just the saw part. Just the saw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man, it'd be a lot of fun. I love that stuff. Listen, I I I have respect for any individual that is an intense person, has a fucking crazy work ethic, and it takes skill to do something. I don't care what it is. And me and Chris were talking about this the last couple days, you know. If you're a violinist, and you're a good violinist, fuck, good, I'm glad, I'm happy for you. I'm gonna clap, and I'm gonna be, hey, that's a great job, 10 years doing it. If you read books, hey, and you read, and you read 300 books, you've read probably 299 books more than I have. You know, more power to you. I try to support everybody in whatever it is. And if it's cutting wood, Bro, listen, I've seen some of that stuff, and that takes skill. I don't yep. care what anybody says. It takes hard work, dedication, and determination to do that and get good at that. You know? did not expect that uh, axe drop and uh, comment to come back at you that way. Not hey, I wasn't uh, knocking it. <laughs> I wasn't knocking it. Have you, have you actually seen one of those tournaments? Oh, yeah. Like, bro, it's yeah. ridiculous, bro. It's big in Oregon. Yeah, it's, it's... too many trees. <laughs> it's ridiculous, man. That, that stuff is... Especially those guys when they axe the, the, the wood on, on, under their feet, mm -hmm. they just go bam, bam, yeah. bam, man. That takes some skill, bro. That takes some skill. Yeah, if you go too crazy with that, you might have a problem with all the Portland hippies. I don't know. I, I've got the speed X in the office, and I think Jesse has some cottonwood at his at his house. Maybe we just might do some before Maybe you leave. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. I'm all about it, and my arms are good. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we practiced uh, we practiced the swinging yesterday. So, oh yeah, uh, yeah, you did. Yeah, you same, did. same time. We did so. some hammer yeah. stuff yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> that's gonna be fun. Good time. When's your first speed X competition, Chris? Well, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to get into the whole thing. You know, we're we're just going to start with a couple 
you know, skills to uh, practice. Uh, so. uh, the uh, basics. Uh, we got to start yeah, with the yeah, basics. Yeah. We it take, it takes a big level of investment to get involved oh, with yeah. that sport. So, but the hot saw competition that that sounds pretty good. Hot saw. Hot saw. So you basically have a snowmobile engine hooked up to a chainsaw oh, yeah, blade. Right, right. Yeah, mm. it's like three hundred pounds of saw. You just pick it up and it just basically. Falls. Chops through a giant, you know, and they gotta do twenty like, inch but, round, but a whole bunch of things like yeah. went, went, went like that. Eing. Yeah, they're still oh, yeah. and they gotta be like they've gotta be straight, and you can't, yeah, you know, yeah. so thick. And uh, I've seen that one too. But yes, yeah, you but know, that saw's gotta be. How much is that saw? That saw's gotta be like oh, yeah. ridiculous amount of money. Yeah, yeah, hopped up. But of course, that it, you know that. I, I find that I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You need that. I just want to build it. You I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> you need that in your life. You, you, need, a, you need a ten thousand dollar saw in your life. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I'm not complete until I have one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we, God. we might need some serious safety regulations here if you're gonna put together a saw like that in the back. Oh, my That's God. a whole other level. Uh, that is too much. Yeah, I guess. I'm Jesse, what are you working on back there? Well, Dolphin said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. I'm down. You do the saw, and I'll do the hacksing, and we're good. Yep. I'm telling you, the team combo on the on the on the on the flash saw. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That would be good. How much one of those things cost? One of those. I saws? think those ones are like uh, like two grand for like that. Because they're play. big. They're yeah. really big. They're like yeah. They're long. Yeah. They're There's really probably long. not a lot of people making them, and they got to be like probably hand ground, you know, sharpened. Yeah, hard and sharpened. So. Yeah. My speed axe was only like, you guys really fast. Yeah, yeah I was like, 2000, yeah. I was like, oh, you buy it. Yeah. You, buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you buy it, I'll come over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so next, yeah, next trip I got to come out, I've got to have the speed saw and a 50 cal mounted to the... Uh, to the Durango. To, to the, uh, yep. To the Dodge. So, uh, okay. That'll be the next video, guys, by the way. It's going to be a uh, 50 cal on top of the Dodge Durango, souped up. It's going to be a good video for that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that'll be good stuff. It'll be a crazy day. <laughs> You'll be able to get up that hood, though. You know, I kind of like Tony. He's got a lot of passion about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're passionate <laughs> individuals. That's right. <laughs> we're intense people. <laughs> oh, God. Well, we asked, uh, so we have one of, uh, I think he's current SWAT right now, Brooks. Yep. Yeah, he was with us yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So we asked him on a podcast that we had with him mm -hmm. what the craziest story he had from being on the job was. And he gave us a story about some guy, how do I say this on the podcast? Uh, he chopped his pecker off. <laughs> he chopped his member off. And his nice. hand, too. And his hand. Because nice. they were doing bad things together. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You, uh, can you top that story? Oh, Anything my God. Anything you can say on the air that we can I mean, top that by? Honestly, God, I've seen you have so much. Yeah, I mean, I've seen so much. Uh, shotgun to the face, you know, uh, where the guy's freaking eyebrow is still on the wall. We've had that before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, it's all. Picture. Yeah. yeah it's, eyebrow. Yeah, literally, that's what happened. It was like the guy you know, pretty much you know, committed suicide, took the shotgun to the face. He literally bought the shotgun, wrote the note, and then um, put it to his face, blew his brains out, blew his face off. When we were coming into the room, the team, you know, we were coming into the room, that guy. This, I guess the top left, was it the top left? Yeah, it was the top left portion of his head and his eye socket was plastered on the top of the wall where you could still see it was a perfect eyebrow or perfect Ooh. skin, you know? Well, you need to stop it with these questions. Brain My audience wants it. Yeah. It's yeah. not me. I, no, I mean, <laughs> decapitations, you, you name it. I've done in Miami, there's not much. You know, I, I, you know I it's a, I, I, I've noticed this, and it, it, is that Anytime there's like some sort of like totally freak thing that's happened, you know, like somebody eating somebody else's face or something like that. That like, happened not in Miami. Exactly. Ex <laughs> anytime there's some sort of any just it's down South Florida. It's in Florida. Like yeah. in Florida, a yeah. hey, da da da. In Florida, yeah. it's like always. Whatever that freak headline is, you go in there and it says. From Florida. Florida. Yeah, from Florida. 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 Yeah. I don't know that what it is. I don't know what it is. But yeah. 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 City of Miami, they, 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 the guy was on bath salts and it was a guy yeah. eating another guy's face, police officer down scene. Yeah. That wasn't that wasn't fun. But yeah, I mean it's hard for me to think. I, I gotta sit back and think about it. Um it's just it's so many things, you know. Uh, I've been involved in like almost everything there was, you know, and Basically, you see it all. You could imagine it yeah, if you could imagine it at one point or another. I've seen it or been in, you know, contact with it or something. I mean, 
it's just called disassociation. It's like the military, same thing. You try to disassociate yourself from seeing those things, from being involved in those things. It can't be that you easy know. of a task. Um, no, some guys struggle with it. it for a long time. Yeah, some guys struggle with it. Um, I, I've always tend to leave work at work. Some guys don't. Some guys bring it, bring it home, and that's that's where you have problems. When you bring it home, or you let. I mean, we've had a guy where some guy saw walks goes up on the scene, and the guy pretty much blows his brains out in front of the cop. The cop has to see, you know, counselor for like three weeks. You know what I mean? Yeah, that happened in my career. I think that happened to me like two or three times, where the guy was just freaking. I looked at this guy, and the guy looked at me, bah, just blew his brains out right in front of me. You know, doesn't affect me. It's part of the job, I think, for me. Like, I, I saw it, okay? And for me, I'm more worried about what's the next, what's the next task. Like, I had one incident where it was a, a, uh, a SWAT operation where, um, man, I don't remember exactly why we were there. I think it was because of something like that, like a suicide. And we were there because they were saying that he was gonna commit suicide. And he opens the door. I was the first uh, SWAT guy to get on the scene. He opened the door. We didn't know exactly what he looked like. So when I looked through the door, he was actually laying on a mattress on the floor. Um, his father had just come out of the, of the apartment, so I thought he was his father. So I closed the distance between he, him and his father, and when I look to my left, the guy looks at me. We make eye contact for a split second, picks up the gun. Before I could even turn around with my gun, my gun was in my hand, when I turned around by the time he had already blown his brains out, you know, he, you know, he shot himself. My first instinct was not so much, oh man, he just did that. My instinct was, I just want to make sure there's nobody else in that house that has a gun or can hurt any of my partners, you know what I mean? So the next con you know, the next element in there is, okay, clear the guy from the gun, and next thing is, hold point on this door, get your team in, in there, we gotta clean this house, you know? Take the old man, put him, put him somewhere where he's out of stuff. That's what you're thinking about right. at work, you know? Uh, obviously when you like, okay, the scene's over, everything's over, then you sit back and it's like, man, that guy just took his, his life, you know? And, and you try not to dwell on it, you know, if you dwell on it, I didn't know the guy personally. Obviously, when you know someone personally, it always has more of an effect on you. Or when it's little kids involved, let's say a two-year-old, a three-year-old, when you go on a scene and a kid's drowned, or a kid choked on something, or you know he passed uh, away from yeah, from yeah. from SIDS. Yeah. You know what I mean? Something like that. And we had all of those cases in, in, in my city. Um, yeah, it's it's that always affects you a little bit. I mean, we've had one time a drowning kid. Uh, the fire the firefighters got on scene. The rescue got on scene. Brought the kid back to life. Okay, um, twice, he died twice, brought the kid back to life twice. They put him on the, in the fire rescue truck trying to keep him alive and he passed away again. Uh, and um, they all had to go home that day. They all were done for the day. They were like, you know, they were really affected by that. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that, you right. know what I mean? You bring this kid back to life and then you pass away and you bring him back to life again. Man, I did it, we did it, we, we, we yeah. you know. And then you realize that it's not even in your hands. You're gonna do your job, you do as best you can. But just sometimes there's nothing you could do. Even if you would have brought that kid back to life, you gotta think about it. You don't even know if he's gonna be a vegetable. You know? You know, that, that kind of reflects a little bit on uh, that uh, motivational video you showed me in the car last night. Like, yeah. It's like, you know, all you can do at the end of the day is try to do the best that you can do and, and uh, you know, have an impact on, you know, those around you in the world and do it. And, you know, as long as, if you put everything forth that you have, yeah. That's that's all you've got to give. If things go beyond that, you yeah. it was out of your control in that manner. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I I pretty much for me, there's two main things that I live by. I mean, one is um, be better every day. Be just a little bit better. If you get a little bit better every single day, you're good. You're heading the right track. You just don't want to go backwards, you know. And um, everyone you know knows something you don't. Every single person you know in your life knows something you don't. So you learn from everybody. I learn from you, I learn from you, Brandon. You, you know, uh, you guys learn from me. Yesterday I was teaching you, Chris. Today you're gonna be teaching me on some of the stuff, you know. Uh, you have to be smart enough to understand that. If you think you know it all, if you think you're-, you're, you're lost. You've yep. already lost. Yep. You're already, you're on a downward spiral. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you get to that point where, oh, I don't need to do this, or I don't need to, I know that already, you know. You can always learn something from somebody. I learn things from my students all the time. Just the way that they hold the gun, or, or even it is, Helping that student out, I said it a certain way, or I, I was able to describe it to him a certain way that really helped him. He taught me something. He's like, man, this is another way that I could teach another student. Maybe that doesn't understand it, the, the normal ways that I teach it. So you just never know. You know, the way that you express yourself, the way that you talk to people, when people tell you things, all these different aspects, you know, you got it. you're learning. You learn every day. Yeah. You know, and every, and every 
whether it's fitness, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's NFL, I don't care whatever sport it is, whatever you're doing, every single day changes. The laws change every day. You tell people, cops, you know, that have been cops 10, 15, 20 years, you know, you can be a cop 25 years, and the next day they change everything on you. Now it's not doing reports anymore on Henry. Now it's doing reports on a computer. So you gotta learn all over again everything. And it doesn't matter if you've been a cop 20 years. You know what I'm saying? You as, as squatting, I'm sure every day you come in here and you learn something new every single day. Whether it's in your brain, you're like, oh man, that's a new design that I could do. Oh man, that, that might work for this. I can design this, a new product that I'm gonna come out with. Whatever it is, something that you did just snapped in your head. You know? Well, that's that's something, yeah, I always believe in this. Yeah, nothing is, some, things are gonna always be better. People always ask us like, where do our tools come from? Where does our, you know, our methods come from? It's like, it's as we believe that things can always be better. And just because this is the way it's been done, and, and that's where you're learning in that process, right? Yeah, you know, of course. That, that discovery. And the application of it, yeah. you know, of, of doing it. That's another big thing that I, I always tell a lot of people, they spend all their time uh, reading books 90% of the time is reading books. They spend it doing that, reading and learning, instead of actually going out and applying it. You gotta do both. You gotta do both. You gotta do both. You know, uh, if you spend, you figure that guy that you're reading that book from, whatever it is, how did he get there? He didn't get there by writing the book. He got there by doing something to write that book, mm -hmm. right? But he had to go out there and, and struggle, trial and error, figure out, hit walls, do whatever. If you spend your whole entire life trying to get smarter by reading the books and not going out there hitting your own walls, having your own problems, then how you figure that you're ever going to be able to write your own book? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, so everybody's always caught up on, you know, um, college degree, college degree. Probably what, 70% of the multimillionaires in the world don't even have a college degree. Now don't get me wrong, I respect somebody who has a college degree and it's great to be smart, it's great to be, but you can't hang everything you do. How many people have college degrees now can't even find a job? Yep. It's a mixture. You've it's got a, it. You've you know, got it. You've got to do both. You've both. got to be. You've got to go out there, seeking to educate yourself and try not to make the same mistakes that other people have. Try not to learn, you know, learn by making the same mistakes that other people have already done. Yeah. But you've also got to like put it to use and you got to put get, it to use. Get, get in the trenches and actually learn. What does that really mean? What does it really mean? Because I learned that early in my uh, when I became a cop in the academy. That you have it's like a four month academy. Mm -hmm. So I went through corrections and through police. So two totally two different academies, right? Um, everything they teach you there, you may use 10% of it on the street. Maybe 10 if you're lucky. 10, maybe. All the books and all the laws, when you get on that street and you got a guy that doesn't want to go to jail, they don't teach you that in the books. <laughs> you get me? They don't teach you that. They're, they're, there's nothing in a book that's going to tell you how to get that guy and put handcuffs on him. You're going to have to learn that on your own. You know. So there's a big difference between pages and chapters and real world and real life. You gotta be able to do both. Real, real world tactical. Right? Real world tactical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, real world idiot sometimes. I'll tell you that. That's what I. Uh, so I think for as many people who are like in law enforcement or tactical populations who are watching this, you probably have just as many, if not more, uh, just regular people who are interested in getting into that. You know, so having yeah. a really extensive background in that. What advice do you have for? someone who's not yet a cop or not yet in uh, fire or military to get into that, to get into the, to the next level or to even advance your career, what advice do you have for that? Um, it's really hard now to get in, obviously, because there's so many people in lines and, you know, the, the waiting lists are, especially for the bigger bigger counties and stuff. If that's something that you really, really want to do, um, and it's, then you just you can't quit at it because the process is a pain in the ass. It's literally like... Some departments it'll take you a year, year and a half to get on, and you gotta pass a poly, you gotta pass a psych, you gotta pass the physical agility test, you gotta pass the the, uh, the doctor stuff, you know. So and it's one thing will happen, then two months later you get called for the other thing. Two months later you get called for the other thing, and hoping that you pass everything, you know. And then you have to go to the academy, and then you gotta get certified. So it's pretty much just having that never quit attitude, or like don't give up. You know, there's people that become police officers at 30 years old. There's others that come at at 40 years old. So uh, if that's what you really want, then you just gotta pretty much apply to as many departments as you can at the same time, and then go through the process and see which one picks you up first. Once you get your certification in whatever state you're in, then you can go to whatever department you want. You know, it's, it's easy now, because you're already, you already got your cert, you know, you got your, in Florida it's your FDLE, you know, a certification. So in whatever state you're in, I get hired by this department, it's a smaller department, 
doesn't matter. Now I can apply to all these other departments and I just gotta do just a, a crossover or lateral where it's like I don't have to go through the whole academy all over again. It's just pretty much going through the process of, of hiring, you know. It's a tough, listen, it's a tough market now, especially against all the things that are happening with law enforcement now as well, you know, the budget cuts and the way people look at police officers and a lot of people don't like police officers and, you know, so it, it's tough, it's tough. Yeah. I say become a firefighter. Yeah. You're better off, everybody likes firefighters. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. <laughs> everybody loves firefighters. Yeah. You know what I mean, you can't go wrong there. And the military, it, 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 you know, depending on what branch you want to go in, depending if you want to go to special operations or not, um, you just have to have that mindset, you know, that the mindset of your never quit attitude, you know, no matter what happens, you're going to die before you quit. As long as you have that attitude and that mindset, you shouldn't have a problem, especially in the military, because that's, that's what they want. They want that mindset. Yeah. They tell you to stand on, on your head and, you know, and do whatever and bark like a dog. That's what you do. That's how it is, you know, and then you do it there until you pass out or you do you, you one of the two things, you know, and you do it, hey, you're good to go, you're not have no problem. The quitters are usually the ones that have issues. And once you get in there, there's no way out. Once you get into the military and like you're in your duty station and stuff and you're like, man, this is not what I thought it was. It's too late. It's too late. Yeah. It's not like a regular job was like, ah, I quit. Uh, you can't quit the military. How many years did you sign up for? Two, four? You're going to do your two or four years. <laughs> yeah, you know, and nobody wants to get out of the military with a dishonorable, so... You gotta suck it up, do your time, take it as an experience, and then and, and then if you decide that you don't want to do it anymore, then you get out. You know, and it only makes you you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know what I'm saying? It only helps you. So, whatever experience you experienced there. Yeah. That's great advice, probably for anything in life. I think so. Be good anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, we, me and Chris, have a lot of the same that we think a lot the same, just because of our intensity that we take into everything that we do. Um, the mindset is key, man. If you don't have the right mindset and any special operations, any military guy, any, any person who's been through a lot of traumatic experiences, um, if your mind isn't right and your mind's not where it needs to be, then you will fail. Because there's going to come a point in your life where your body's just going to give out on you. And if your mind is at the same level as your body, your physical capabilities, you're going to quit. You're going to quit. Your mind has got to be at least always three or four levels above your, your body. Understanding that your body's always going to quit before your mind does. And if you pass out, you pass out. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is. You get back up, somebody will wake you up, you get back up and go. If you throw up, you throw up. It is what it is. Throw up, freaking clean your mouth, drink some water, and go. You know what I'm saying? Your body can continue to go. You just have to put your mind right, you know? Uh, I do that in everything in my whole entire life. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what I did. I, you know, you're gonna have to break me. You have to break me. And everybody that has, has ever worked with me, every single person they know I was, um, they know me on a personal level, you gotta break me. If you wanna beat me, you're gonna have to break me. You know what I'm saying? And it's not gonna be an easy task. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That mind is everything. It yeah. really is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I can, you know, I think our listeners that will listen to any of my, my life stories or motivational stuff can pick up a uh, pretty similar thought process from the materials that, uh, that I've produced around Oh, well, sure. Yeah, I mean, you don't you don't freaking power lift. You you don't you don't deadlift nine hundred pounds or a thousand pounds and squat nine hundred pounds with a weak mindset. Because any any individual that's right, you're probably the fucking crazy. But let's just let's just keep that here. Right? Uh, anybody that decides that they want to put nine hundred pounds on their back and try to squat it, okay, is either not right in the head or has a very incredible mindset. <laughs> One of the two. Yeah, because yeah, I look at the 100 pounds and I'm thinking to myself, nah, I'll pass on that. Let's take a couple hundred pounds off of there. <laughs> you know, uh, and a lot of the power lifters, and that's why I respect a lot of the power lifters, because they do have that mindset. Because you have to be a very strong mental person to put that heavy weight on you, understanding. Hey, it shit might go wrong, and you've got to be okay yeah, with it. Exactly. You've got to be okay with the fact that. Exactly. I might go down and I might not come back up. Exactly. Like that's just that's just a fact. Yeah, yeah. And you're willing to do it, yep. and that's what it is for whatever passion that you have, yep. or whatever you love, you know. And that's why I respect a lot of those guys. You know what I mean? A lot of powerlifters, and that's why I like the powerlifting community yep. so much. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why I invited you out here. I mean, yeah. uh, and I, I really appreciate you know how quickly you picked up, uh, you know, and responded, saying, "Hey, you know, yeah, that sounds great. We could both kind of learn some stuff from each other, and oh, let's, uh, let's do this." So. Oh, yeah, I want to say one thing. So, me and Chris were talking about this uh, yesterday too. So about the fake plates. 
So we have so much, you know, there's so much controversy and, and all this this garbage that's going on with, you know, all these people that use fake plates and all this this stuff, you know. And uh, he says, you know, oh, I came out here and I was like, yeah, listen, bro, listen, I don't give a fuck. And I'll tell you straight up, where you are, what gym you train at, what time, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Somebody calls me, you know what I'm saying? Like a guy like Chris Duffin, powerlifter, non-powerlifter, bodybuilder, it doesn't matter. I go train anywhere in the country with any fucking plates you have in that damn gym. Individuals like me, like Chris, you know, uh, that fake plates bullshit, is, it, it, it's bullshit. We, we train all, all around the world. You guys gotta understand that. Individuals that use fake plates are guys that go to the same gym all the time. They don't do collaborations. You know, they don't have fake plates in Metroflex. They don't have fake plates here in Kabuki Strength Lab. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. People like him have been tested in meets. You know, it, it's just, you guys gotta be a little bit smarter than that. You know, individuals listening you, to this. You had somebody uh, say that on one of your things. Right? Yeah, on my last, yeah. one of my last videos was my Zerker squats that uh, was running in four, you know, four or five, and then I dropped down to deadlifts, you know, and I was going out to grass with it, but they were like, oh, those fake plates. 405 is not that even that heavy. You know what I'm saying? Like, really, bro? Yeah. And I'm in LA Fitness. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, I'm not going to bring fake plates LA, into LA Fitness. For your circus. For my fucking circus. You know what I mean? It's just. Not like, even go to like 600 or something. Yeah, you know what I mean? Not even fucking. Yeah. You know, shit, if I'm going to make on. it look good, I'm going to make it look good. Come, come on, Tony Castleberry. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> you know, come on now. You know? Yeah. Get real, you know? It's a, and then it's funny because this is. You go to all these different gyms, and I do go destination Dallas. I go to all these different gyms around the country, bro. What do you think? What do you think we do? Do you think that individuals like me, like him, that travel the country, training with whoever, whenever, bro, we take these weights on the plane with us? You know, what I mean, like forty-five plates on the plane with you, like the fuck? It, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be realistic. You know what I'm saying? You don't fucking bring fucking forty-five. Plates. Come on, bro. You know, we smarter than that, bro. People are ignorant <laughs> sometimes. You know, it upsets me because we get a lot of backlash for that stuff. You know, no, it's it, funny though. Uh, to last, was it last week? When were we in? Was it last week we were in Vegas? Yeah. Oh my god, last weekend. Last, well, I was in San Diego last week, and it was uh, Wednesday to yeah. Friday. So yeah, I uh, um, I was at the uh, we're doing the NSCA convention, mm -hmm. and uh, the Sorenex. I know the guy that was running the Sorenex booth, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's a Highland Highland Games competitor I've talked with for for years, and he's like, "We're doing a squat off tomorrow. You want to come join?" And I'm like, "I haven't squatted since March." Yeah. Uh, since the Arnold uh, at the uh, Animal Cage. Yeah, and, Animal uh, Cage. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, fuck, yeah, I'll do okay. it. <laughs> so we go down there, but it's the NSCA, so all they have is bumpers, right? Oh my so god. So we have the plates loaded all well, the way to the end. So that did bar. They even, did they even have a bar that was big enough? Well, to I had the Duffalo bar. Oh, so we ran the Duffalo because their bar is really big. So, so, bar, I ran, yeah. so I ran the Duffalo bar over to their, their thing. But the it was so fucking whippy. If you watched the video, I think I have it on my Instagram. Like on the way down, it's, it's almost like shoving my face in the ground because it's the weights like yeah, it's so it's far so out. Yeah, it's so far out. out. You I mean, gotta it stabilize was, it. The it's... descent like almost killed me. The squatting was easier because it could happen so fast. <laughs> but the way down almost fucking crushed me. Yeah, because it's just like what did you do? What did you time. lift? Uh, I worked up. I did seven seventy one, which was good. Uh, and then I worked up to eight oh five or eight. 811 or something like that. It was, uh, in my opinion, it was a little high because yeah. um, I was freaking yeah, out. Yeah, freaking out, yeah, whipping, yeah, whipping, yeah. whipping. So it worked up to around 800 pounds. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it was wasn't... a little high, 800 pounds. There's but... people that put 800 pounds on their back and they can't even <laughs> hold it on their back. <laughs> and he's bitching because his quad of 800 pounds was a little high. But you should have that it was so fucking, like, I haven't, I've never squatted with, like, the weight stacked that far out. Like, that yeah, so bumper. why? They didn't do so much bar with it. It was fucking crazy. <laughs> bumpers. So you had the big bumpers. You had eight, seven bumpers on each side? Yeah. Fuck. And then on we. Carpet, we, too. On, two layers of carpet. So no, the, the no stabilization at all. Like, the convention carpet, and then they had like a shag carpet on top of that. <laughs> and then the rack was set too high. Everybody says, everybody says I can't, you know, oh, it's, you know, I can only lift out a monolith. But I had to walk it out. But I had to do the twist because I had to pick up one side. Pull it out, then pick up the other side with the oh, other shoulder, oh pull it out, and then, and then walk out from that. Worst was, possible conditions was, ever. <laughs> and you still was, pulled eight hundred. It was uh, it was it was entertaining, but it was it was fun. You know, it was like all these because it's all these strength coaches running around, and they a lot of them didn't even know who we, yeah who I was, and they were just like you could just up? see them like oh my god, what the hell is going on here? Because they never they'd never seen anything like that before. Yeah. You know? So that that's, was it was entertaining. That's bad fun. if you're a strength coach and you've never seen that. That's so. it, that you have no business being a strength coach. <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Like you have obviously you haven't done research. You don't know who, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You don't know who Chris Duffin is. Yeah. You know? 
Because I'm not even, uh, you know, some of these guys dedicate their whole lives to that. They've been in the game 20 years, and then, you know, to see that, it's yeah. like, that should be normal to them, you know? I don't know. I mean, I guess strength conditioning is different than powerlifting. Yeah. But it's still part of the same. That's a lot of team sport or, you know, oh, yeah, that's right, that's stuff, right, yeah. you know, that sort I of get stuff. You. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's strong people in it, but there's not people dedicated to just that. Right? They're squatting. Just like, and, yeah. Your guys aren't, aren't squatting that much. No, Because no, they're, no. You know, their focus is a little different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but listen, regardless, whether you're a strength conditioning coach or not, you should still be familiar with the proper technique of a proper oh, yeah. Yeah. squat. Oh, yeah. Whether it's bodybuilding style, whether it's powerlifting style, whether, you're a strength coach. Strength, coach, you can't be strength. And if you don't know how to do a squat, that's a fucking problem. You have a fucking problem, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I mean, obviously there's always gonna be like little tweaks here and there that each powerlifting might tell you differently, but there's always that basic technique oh, yeah. that you should know. It's still you know. a squat. It's, it's a still squat. a squat, it's exactly. A squat. It's a basic human movement. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, it's not a powerlifting thing, it is a, just a basic yeah, human yeah. movement. We yeah. just have a bar on our back. Exactly, so. exactly, you know, that's crazy. All right, well, I think uh, we're getting about time to uh, to wrap this up. So, awesome. uh, Tony, do you got any uh, last words you'd like to add? No, man, it was just, it's just great being here. We're going to do a training session now. Guys, uh, tune into the YouTube video. It's going to be coming out hopefully soon, not too long. Um, it, it'll probably be on my channel as well as uh, Chris's channel. Uh, you have the, Your channel is the Kabuki Strength? Um, Kabuki07 is the YouTube channel. Oh, the YouTube but channel. links, uh, kabukistrength.com has a link to all the, links, so, and all the yeah. links to our social media. Okay, yeah. So, and then, uh, uh, it'll be on my channel as well. Where uh, where can people, where can our listeners find you uh, on um, social media? So Instagram, it's real world underscore tactical. Facebook, just real world tactical. Or Tony Sent Manat um, dash real world tactical because I have two pages on Facebook. And then um, my website's real world dash tactical.com. There you can find my program, my hybrid. Uh, program there available and then all my products will be coming out hopefully by the end of the year and all that stuff so excellent well uh thanks for your time it was great to be here thank you for having me out